Uh, terrific. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the open session of this uh, Financial Stability Board uh, roundtable on uh, LIBOR reform. I'm very uh, pleased uh, that we have this opportunity to meet with uh, many of the institutions uh, from uh, various uh, threads of activity that have been active in helping to achieve a transition from LIBOR uh, to the risk-free rates that have I been identified by the various working groups in each of our jurisdictions. Uh, the Financial Stability Board has coordinated the international effort to reform interest rate benchmarks at the direction of the G20. This is an important effort, not just in the United States, around the globe, uh, but nowhere is it of more importance than in the jurisdictions that rely on LIBOR. So let's review the reasons why we're here. Uh, by the time of the financial crisis, much of the global financial system had come to rely on LIBOR. And yet LIBOR was, all along, a very poorly structured rate. Contributing banks were asked to submit quotes without any requirement of evidence of transactions or other facts to back them up, uh, which made them susceptible to manipulation. Uh, thanks to subsequent reforms, contributors now provide this type of evidence where possible, but uh, LIBOR is based on an underlying market uh, with so few transactions that there's relatively, relatively little direct evidence uh, that they can provide, uh, even though they now try to provide it. Many submitting banks are therefore uncomfortable with this situation. Some have sought to stop their participation. As a result, the official sector has had to step in to support LIBOR by securing a voluntary agreement with the remaining banks to continue submitting through 2021. And at the same time, the official sector, again globally, has convened national working groups to help develop alternative risk-free rates and navigate a very complicated transition. Many people uh, have used reference rates with little thought. The experience with LIBOR should teach us that this has to change and that we can't risk making this kind of mistake again as we transition away from LIBOR. Banks should conduct at least as much due diligence on the reference rates that they use as they conduct on the creditworthiness of their borrowers. And the national working groups convened by many of the FSB member authorities have performed that type of diligence uh, with the secured overnight funding rate, or SOFR, and the risk-free rates that have been identified in other jurisdictions. Uh, that effort has been a clear and, I think, positive example of public-private sector cooperation. Uh, and these alternative risk-free rates that have been created or, substantial, uh, or substantially reformed to ensure that robust transaction-based rates that actu accurately represent well-defined underlying markets are consistent with internationally recognized standards and that they are available. I want to thank the many institutions here today and the many more that have played equally constructive roles for their efforts in this process. This month marks the one-year anniversary of SOFR and is close to the one-year anniversary of the other new risk-free rates. Over that year, we have seen the establishment of new futures markets, cleared swap markets, and debt markets based on these new rates. So for futures, which didn't exist a year ago, have seen more than $7 trillion in cumulative notional volumes. This has been a crucial development for market liquidity, and it's helping to spur the growth of SOFR swaps and other derivative markets. And SOFR is being used in cash products with $81 billion in SOFR linked debt issued over the past year. New markets, as everyone around this table knows, do not arise overnight. In normal circumstances, they can take decades to develop. So what's been accomplished in the past year is remarkable. And at the same time, we only have a little over two and a half years until the point at which LIBOR could end and the transition needs to continue to accelerate. Uh, the private sector needs to take on this responsibility. Uh, we do expect you to do so. The Federal Reserve's supervisory teams are including the transition away from LIBOR in their monitoring discussions with larger firms. Uh, the Fed will expect to see an appropriate level of preparedness at the banks it supervises. And as the Alternative Reference Rate Committee, or ARC, continues to make progress on industry-led approaches to the transition, the transition paths away from LIBOR will become clearer for banks of all sizes. Uh, but while we expect the private sector to take on this responsibility, we in the public sector must also recognize our need to help. The Financial Stability Board has supported this transition globally. And in the United States, the Financial Stability Oversight Council 
has supported the ARC's work. It's important that we continue to do so, and muscularly, and I want to thank you all today for the thoughts you've shared with us on this transition and what's needed to make it succeed. Uh, and now, nope, not that one either. Well, I knew I was supposed to do that. Let me turn to Andrew Bailey. Thanks, Randy. That's very kind of you. Um, let me first of all thank uh, Chris and his colleagues at the CFTC for organizing this event and Randy and, uh, and the FSB for, for also uh, being part of it. Uh, uh, and it's a very important time, as Randy set out. Um, just to re-emphasize a couple of the things that Randy said. First of all, the argument and the case for the transition away from LIBOR hasn't changed, in my view. Randy set out the you know, the, the reasons why that's the case, and the reasons why as the regulator, the FCA, as the regulator of LIBOR, we do not take a view that we can, we can continue to uh, compel, whether that be explicit or implicit, uh, banks to continue to participate in the setting process for all the reasons that Randy outlined uh, beyond the end of 2021. We don't think that's appropriate, and that it is, in that sense, too fragile. The other thing that I, and I've said this before, but I'll just echo it again, underlying that also, is that LIBOR, two things about LIBOR. First, its uses have spread very broadly over many years without a real, what I might call, strategy behind it. Um, it originated in the, uh, really in the euro currency markets, which is why it's the London uh, interbank operate. Uh, but those markets don't exist anymore. I, I, when I started my career, there was a very clear distinction between international markets uh, and domestic markets, and authorities and central banks you know, had a role in domestic markets, and somehow these international markets existed, not just completely disconnected from the, from, from the domestic markets, but on their own, which is why, the reason I emphasize that is why LIBOR is not a true risk-free rate. It isn't a risk-free rate. It never has been. And the reason I also say that is that a big part of what we're doing, really, is to, is to reunite the interest rate setting process, and in my view, correctly, link it back to domestic interest rate setting processes, which is why SOFA, SONIA, TONA, other rates that have been set are just that in many ways. And that's an important part of the process. So I was going to speak this morning on, 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 on how we see the end game. Um, well, let me first of all emphasize one important thing. Of course, the end game isn't just going to happen. Actually, the end game is, is substantially influenced by what we do now. Uh, uh, both the actions we take, the issues we identify, and how we solve those issues. So this is a critical point in time. Secondly, we've made a lot of progress, as, as Randy also said, over the last year. A year ago, we were launching the, the, the new benchmarks, relaunching them in some cases, but they were all going through various launch phases. And I think a, a year on, we can, we, can, we can look at it and say that we've achieved a lot. To be honest, we've achieved as much as I thought we would achieve, and in some, in some areas, we've achieved more. So I'm not um, sitting here today saying, oh dear, we haven't got to where we thought we would get to. The second thing that's happened in the last year, which I think is good news, very good news, is that for, certainly for the, for the non-dollar currencies in, involved in LIBOR, the ISDA fallback process, the consultation around that and the determination of the outcomes has, has in my view, gone well. And I fully expect, expect that to set a good precedent for the, for the dollar process. And that's good. We need that. That's good. So, uh, how do we get to the end game? Well, we have to identif identify the, the issues that need tackling and, of course, deal with them. I think the next, in a sense, big piece of the picture that needs to fall into place is that term structures need to, need to emerge, which can be used. I, I am optimistic that that will happen. I, I think it is natural that that will happen as a product of what we've done over the last year. Um, they're not going to that to pick up Randy's point about this needing to be a collaboration, they're not going to emerge in isolation. They're not going to emerge by regulatory fiat. They're going to emerge by, by use uh, and obviously by having data uh, uh, that can be used to create them. So we need to do that. We need to see it happens. But again, I'm optimistic that that will happen. And that's, a big, that's an important piece of the picture. I think we also have to come back to a question which follows from what I said earlier. While it's, I think it's, it is the case that the use of LIBOR grew up without um, really sort of great strategic planning. I think there is some logic to why it, why it spread probably you know, well beyond its original 
sort of a, what you might call natural sort of, uh, in a sense, area. And that is because I think for, for many, particularly for many banks, it makes a great deal of sense to have fewer rather than more uh, interest rate benchmarks. So it makes a great deal of sense to be more, if I more, have more homogeneity in terms of uh, managing interest rate risk on the balance sheet, uh, hedging, uh, and therefore, I think it made a great deal of sense that, you know, in one sense, that helps to explain why LIBOR spread. I think it should also tell us that there probably is a natural demand to have, um, you know, a smaller number of, of, of future benchmarks. Um, it, it, to, to Randy's point, that is, you know, importantly for the market to, to shape and influence. But my, you know, my guess is that, you know, since, since firms are in the business of managing net interest margins, particularly in the banking world, um, that would be a natural outcome. And I think it is sensible to play for that. So while I think it's important to distinguish between the derivatives market use of benchmarks and the cash market use of benchmarks, because they are different, even though they've all, they've all used LIBOR, um, I think there are good reasons why the two will stay, uh, to my view, linked together. So what is the end game at that point then? We have a number of, I think, pieces that have to, have to be tackled collectively to fall into place. I think we have to get to grips with uh, regulatory accounting and tax issues uh, collectively uh, because uh, they are complicated and they have, the, they have the capacity to obstruct the progress we want and they may have the, also have the capacity to obstruct what I might call a sort of a quite a large, um, in a sense, coincident move towards solving these problems. If, 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 if all parties can see those, those issues tackled, then... I think there's, there's a greater chance that we'll all, you know, we'll see a, a, a wider move together to sort to solve the uh, to solve the end game issues. I think that, in my mind, and I'll be quite honest with you, all of the work that we have to do in those areas together, um, all of the work that we also need to do, I should say, on um, spreading uh, an understanding of what's going on of messaging what's going on so that all parts of the market understand it, can come up to speed with it and use it. We will, I think, get to a point where we have to then tackle what I would call the irreducible legacy. But we have to identify that and we have to minimize it. You know, there will be awkward issues out there. There will be awkward products out there, no doubt, which will be harder to solve than, than others. And we have to get the, collectively get those issues onto the table because I suspect that will be the true end game. But the, the, the reason that I think we need to, to solve these other issues first is because I think it suits all of our purposes for the, if you like, the irreducible core that has to then be tackled by all of us, you know, putting our heads together, needs to be as small as it possibly can. If we leave it larger, we're just going to make the problem bigger and threaten the, threaten the end objective. So I see this year, to, to finish, I see this year as, very, as vital. It's vital to make progress on the next steps. I think term structure is important. The next is the consultation on fallbacks is very important. These are all big building blocks. And we need to, secondly, do the work together on issues like tax accounting and regulation. Um, we've set some work going in. The, John and I chair the FSB group have set work going in that context. But to pick up Randy's point, we're not going to solve these issues on our own because of, we're not the experts on them. You're the expert. You're the market is the experts on them. What I would like to do, uh, what I'd like to do, I want to do, is come back really later this year when we've got a better sense of the progress we're making on those issues, we've made more progress on those issues, and we start to have a clearer line of sight on what the sort of, what I might call the sticky and difficult legacy might be, because there's no question that then we're going to have to have some you know, fairly intensive conversations to see what we do about that. So I'm going to leave it there. Thanks. Thanks, Andrew. That's very... Uh, very clear and useful. Uh, let me turn to uh, Craig Phillips uh, from the U.S. Treasury uh, for your thoughts. Craig. Good, terrific. Thanks, Randy. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, the FSB and uh, the Federal Reserve and CFTC for organizing uh, today's events on behalf of the Secretary Mnuchin Treasury. Uh, pleased to be um, participating and, and hearing the excellent thoughts that were discussed today. I think everyone here uh, that's gathered understands how critical a smooth transition is for the global financial markets. With LIBOR's viability uh, past 2021 at risk, market participations must uh, critically become preparations for this transaction. Waiting for potential fixes to LIBOR or the creation of other alternative indices whose viability cannot be safely be assumed is not a feasible option. 
We used to have an expression that hope is not a strategy. If you're hoping this will just go away or address it at some future date, that's, that's uh, not the right approach. And so taking this very seriously now for the end game uh, is, is, is very important. So we really, uh, Treasury applauds uh, and appreciates them being involved in the work of ARC. Uh, the impact of ARC's work is apparent with the organization that we've gotten to, uh, the daily publication of SOFR, the trading of SOFR futures, uh, the training and clearing of SOFR swaps, all of which are occurring on or ahead of schedule. In February, our Office of Financial Research adopted a final rule which will establish a data collection for central cleared repo transactions uh, working with the Federal Reserve, which will be used to support and enhance the calculation of SOFR. So that's one small way in which Treasury is uh, getting involved to support the effort. I know many of you might be impact, uh, impacted by the uh, uh, impact of that collection, and we appreciate the support. We've also been encouraged by volume of floating rate notes issuance and the growth of investor demand for these products. Growth in the derivative markets have also been increasing, and we've been pleased to see the highest volume of SOFR-based swaps trading this month. Uh, greater cash product issuance is leading to increased trading of derivatives, and while a forward-looking term rate would be help in the transition, uh, market participants should uh, have input to that but not wait uh, strictly to take those actions. I would like to say that leadership is very important from a market uh, point of view. We do have here today the uh, CEO of Freddie Mac, the president of Fannie Mae, and the president of the Home Loan Bank Capital Markets, and we'd really acknowledge them as uh, showing tremendous leadership and issuance and adoption, both on the uh, financing side, but also on the uh, mortgage product side and other first movers. So many of you at the table are in a position in the public and private sector to exert uh, similar leadership, but we would like to acknowledge uh, that tremendous effort. To put money where my mouth is, you know, the U.S. Treasury is actively studying SOFR as an issuer. We, we run a large floating rate uh, note program. We are in the very early stages of studying uh, the implications of uh, SOFR as, a, as a, a means of issuance for the U.S. Treasury. Um, you know, we have a large program, so we have to be mindful of the impact of volume. And also, we want to have a regular and predictable issuance program. So this will be a study that will unfold for some period of time. But we do think uh, that it's an important priority. Uh, we are in the process of a large conversion of our auction system, as been previously announced. Project Titan that we're doing with the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. I think to manage expectations, we have decided that if we do issue in SOFR, we'd implement it after uh, the new system is in place, because it's a front-to-back operating auction and data system, and it would be inefficient for us to convert our old retiring system. Uh, so we will focus on that event, which is a 2020 event uh, for SOFR capability when and if the Treasury decides to, uh, to issue. I th I'd say the sooner market participants plan for this, it's, it's critical. Liquidity will move together. Uh, this involves uh, intermediaries, which are represented today, but also who you might call the customers or money owners. So really having people move together and as quickly as possible rather than waiting for an end date uh, is critical. Uh, institutions that look to the forthcoming publication of ARC suggest that a contract fallback language must be adopted. This is relevant to securitizations, business and consumer loans, and floating rate notes, as well as the supplemental consultation that ISDA is developing relating to fallback language for swap contracts. Today we've talked a lot about accounting implications, but also tax implications. I have stated that Treasury and working with IRS and tax policy is taking the development of uh, tax uh, 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 interpretations and guidance very seriously. There was an early effort created on that uh, in the beginning of this process almost a year ago. I do think that there's two points about this. First, tax and accounting frequently go together, so this requires a lot of input from both disciplines and also global coordination. Um, and also, um, uh, the, the nature of the tax treatment has to be quite specific. So I think for input, what will be most useful to this process is for everyone to think about all the different permutations of the tax interpretation that's needed. So as we have a tax ruling that it uh, is durable and really bakes into it all the different uh, applications. But uh, at Treasury, we're very committed to delivering a timely tax interpretation, and we really appreciate um, all the industry and official sector input and coordination internationally. So we've been very involved in this from the beginning. We're a member of ARC. Uh, we want to thank everyone uh, 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 for their time today, and it's been very insightful to hear uh, from the industry different um, aspects that we should consider. Thanks, Craig. Uh, thanks very much. Now uh, let's turn to Chris Giancarlo. Thanks, Randy, and I'll be brief. I've, I've put out a statement for the press, but I just would like to um, just 
few extemporaneous comments. I'd like to say I share uh, Andrew's optimism about getting to the end goal, but I think I also share his sanguineness about the remaining issues are, are naughty and complicated and, and not easily resolved. But I also say I share Randy's willingness to be muscular in getting there. And um, I would say we, we offer three mechanisms for, for the CFTC's role in this, which is on the derivative side. And, and, and one I mentioned earlier is, is that is that our, our no action relief, we've, we've been able to use that in a very targeted fashion with regard to a unique circumstances uh, such as Brexit. And I think we could use that in a targeted way for unique circumstances. Uh, Tom Dees, you're certainly right. There's a lot of conversations going on. But at some point, that has to result in a specific request to us. And when we have a specific request, I can, I can assure you that we'll take that very seriously and see if we can deliver that. And how that gets coordinated with overseas regulators, I think, is the second mechanism that, that I offer up. And that is that we, those sitting at the panel here on, on, the, on the official sector, speak about this regularly. We, we, we are very coordinated. We speak often. We, we convene assemblies like this, but we also have a lot of conversations at virtually every time we meet, that whether it's uh, in, in Basel or in London or elsewhere. We're, we're, so we're very focused on getting this done. And so, um, uh, so we have that. And then it's specifically at the CFTC, our Market Risk Advisory Committee has, has created a subcommittee chaired by Tom Whiff. And I think that under, under my fellow commissioner, Russ Benham, and it provides a very good forum for you all to come together and talk about a lot of these issues and provide a forum where you can explore what some commonalities might be and what some areas moving forward, which then can inform us and we can be part of that conversation early on. Hopefully that might then res result in some relief, which we can then take back to the broader group. So um, uh, optimistic, uh, but not uh, naive about the challenges. As, as Randy said, and I'll end on this note, I, I think we may someday look up, back on this when we get to the other side of the mountain as the ideal way of resolving issues like this through this public-private partnership. There's a few uh, global efforts right now that are ongoing that are regula regulator only, and they're not making the type of progress that this group is meeting. I know we've got many more mountains to cross, but it's remarkable, and we do at some point need to take stock of how far we've come. A lot more to go, but we're there with you, and, and together we can get this done. Terrific. Thank you. Thank, uh, thanks, Chris. Uh, uh, let me ask uh, David Ramsden from the Bank of England if you'd like to make a few comments. Thank you very much, and thank you uh, for the opportunity that the FSB and uh, the CFTC have given me to speak this morning. I think events like this remind us of the scale and complexity of the transition undertaking, the number of firms that are affected, both financials and corporates, and second, rem the events remind us of the importance of coordination and collaboration, both internationally and between the public and private sector. And I do want to applaud the FSB and the OSSG, as well as the ARC and other public-private partnership bodies for the leadership roles they're playing. Now, for part two of the UK's contribution to, the, to today's conversation, following Andrew's comments on LIBOR's endgame, I'm going to focus briefly on its successor, in sterling, Sonia. And, and while um, dollar LIBOR makes up the vast majority of exposure, of exposures, sterling LIBOR is also significant. And so reform efforts on sterling LIBOR matter for the global effort we're all engaged in. And as Randy reminded us, this April marks the first uh, birthday, not just of SOFA, but also Sonia. The Bank of England took on responsibility for production of Sonia and Reform Sonia was first published on 23rd of April last year. And 2018-19, the year since then, has been a year for real progress in establishing Sonia as the successor to Sterling LIBOR. Our strongest areas of success have been in floating rate notes and in derivatives. Sonia linked FRN issuance now dominates Sterling floating rate financials issuance, and the bond market has clear momentum towards using the compounded Sonia rate. So far in 2019, we've seen 22 issues from banks, sovereigns, and supranationals that have referenced compounded Sonia and a, with a total value of about 13 billion pounds. And in derivatives, the notional value of cleared Sonia swaps is now only slightly less than cleared LIBOR referencing swaps, with Sonia starting to dominate at shorter maturities. And in other areas, we're seeing progress, as we've heard today, though there's further to go. 
Sonia futures as a share of the overall market have increased materially, but still stand as a small proportion of the total. We're now starting to see some Sonia-based securitizations. We're yet to see a Sonia-linked loan, but we're hearing suggestions that it should be possible to see one relatively soon. And one of our major financial institutions has just announced that it's going to rebase its entire balance sheet to Sonia. Now, there's obviously a need for further progress in building the infrastructure required, not just to issue, but to hold value and risk manage Sonia-based instruments. But we have a positive market-driven plan geared towards finding solutions to the further barriers to further to transition. The UK's equivalent to the ARC, our sterling risk-free rate working group, the market-led group whose objective is to catalyze the broad-based transition to using Sonia, chaired by uh, Tushar Mazaria, the CFO of, Bar of Barclays, is driving forward this work. And like other speakers this morning, uh, the working group and we see 2019 as a critical year for progress. And so there are three priority task, force, task forces for 2019 that the working group has set up. First, on the development of a Sonia term rate. Second, on regulatory dependencies. And third, on issues arising from the accounting treatments relating to transition. Now, as well as the successes that I've discussed, which can be measured in billions of pounds, we've had successes that are harder to measure, which I think are just as important in shifting the dial on the, tr on the attitude to transition. In the UK, around the middle of last year, we were hearing from some anecdotally that transition was not considered one of the key issues on, C on chief executive's minds. So the UK regulators, the FCA under Andrew, and the Bank of England's PRA took a decision to send a dear CEO letter to our largest firms requesting sight of their board approved plans for managing the risks around libel cessation and for them to name a senior individual who would oversee the work for the, fu uh, for the firm. Now, the technical findings of all this work were valuable, if unsurprising, confirming that exposure to LIBOR is deeply embedded across firms' assets and liability structures, and firms are at very different states of readiness to deal with the transition and associated risks. But the letter has really achieved its original objective of helping to focus senior minds and push the work up in terms of the priority and pace that firms are attaching to it. Now, much like the um, IMF and World Bank meetings that many of us are also here in Washington for, it seems as if we're in the spring for the transition in sterling markets. There are clear green shoots, but there's also a need for further rapid growth and for a heating up in activity. And we see the initiatives being worked on by the working group in the UK and the plans shared by firms as part of that activity. Many firms are already transacting Sonia and other RFRs and are reporting that they're building better fallbacks into their new products. Through a combination of market initiatives, individual firm work plans, and close liaison, li liaison between firms and authorities, we're making good progress in unearthing the knotty issues and developing solutions. Now, while there's a lot to do, there is a growing understanding of the need to do it and of the detail of what that will entail. And I think the exciting developments we've seen in the sterling F FRN market has demonstrated that change can be rapid once the conditions are right. And that's important because, after all, it's now 22 months since Andrew first set out the end 2021 timing. So the pace needs to continue to accelerate in the remaining 32 months. I can assure you that the Bank of England will continue its strong fo focus on LIBOR transition and its close liaison with both other authorities internationally and with the private sector firms as we continue the vital work of transition. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, uh, with those comments from the uh, official sector, I think uh, uh, we might turn to the private sector for comments now. Chris had mentioned that Tom Whip from Morgan Stanley was uh, 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 very involved with their Market Risk Advisory Committee. He's also here representing the Alternative Reference Rate Committee, or ARC, in the United States. Tom, would you like to make a few comments? 
Yes, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, uh, Chairman Qualls, Chairman Giancarlo, for the opportunity and all the members of the official sector here today. Uh, we would really like to, before I begin, we want to do a, an update on the progress of the ARC as well as the progress of the Subcommittee on Interest Rate Reform of the Market Risk Advisory Committee of CFTC. We'll take those in order. but. Uh, I couldn't agree more with the comments that we've heard, which is that 2019 is a mission critical year for this work. There are developments on the horizon, whether it be the ISDA protocol, whether it be actions by the CCPs, whether it be the uh, the, the final release of the uh, of fallback language for cash products from the ARC. All of those developments over this year will serve to give market participants a clear view of the economic of the economic world post 2021 and before. So, with those developments out there, I think what we see is a real need for collective action, a real need for clear problem solving on the remaining challenges. I think the uh, the desire to remove barriers and in many cases remove excuses for implementation need to take place in this year. This is this is mission critical as we take this forward. So as a quick update, uh, I just want to give progress reports as we've seen. So starting with the ARC, if we go back to 2014, the original challenge was to determine a rate that was IOSCO compliant and to lay out uh, a, a, a transition plan. So following the first report, or what was ARC 1.0, uh, broad repo rate, or what now SOFR was determined to be the rate, uh, and following that, we had a pace transition plan, which has been laid out, and I think has been noted before, in many cases, some of those milestones have already been uh, exceeded the expectations. Uh, so with the reconstituted ARC in 2018, uh, had a much broader participant group as we move to implementation and a broader mandate. So the ARC's membership is now comprised of a wide set of private uh, market participants, including banks, asset managers, insurers, industry trade organizations, and obviously the official sector ex officio members. ARC 2.0's mission is to ensure the successful implementation of the, of the PACE transition plan, uh, which was set forth and to coordinate and track planning across financial products as market participants using LIBOR consider transitioning to alternative reference rates where it's deemed appropriate and addressing the risks in legacy contracts with the possibility that LIBOR uh, might end had been not been fully considered and not robust enough to deal with that. So in the past 13 months alone, ARC 2.0 has made significant progress in moving the ball forward uh, on our stated goals. In March 2018, the ARC published a second report this quantified the current portion of the market tied to USD LIBOR, outlined the reasons why SOFR was chosen over the other alternative rates, detailed the pace transition timeline, and set the stage for much of the work uh, that will be ensuing over the next months ahead. Uh, in April of last year, as has been noted, the secured overnight financing rate was first published, and with the choice of SOFR, clearly uh, no one will ever have to question whether it's an IOSCO compliant rate, and the Federal Reserve Bank of New York produces it in a fully transparent way uh, based on market and transactions without relying at, on expert judgment or arbitrary modeling. This is a very high standard, and I believe the ARC met that standard. Since SOFR began publication a year ago, many ARC members have worked very hard to develop SOFR futures, swaps markets, along with the futures exchanges uh, and the clearinghouses, and we've seen significant activity in that regard, which is very, a very positive development. Uh, ARC members have also worked very hard to develop cash market fallback language for those who want to continue using LIBOR. Is this work on a new fallback for derivatives has been very helpful in developing that fallback language and hopefully that work remains very consistent and we can shoot for a, a, our goal obviously I think is at an industry level is to think about a set of triggers and a set of, uh, and a, and a set of fallbacks that will clearly uh, work very hard to cover as much territory as possible. Obviously a lot of discussion which we'll get into a bit about these triggers and and but o overall I think the goal is to have uh, synchronized triggers and uh, synchronized outcomes across as many products and jurisdictions as is possible uh, so I think the uh, as we think about February this year the ARC announced uh, the Federal Reserve open office hours hosted by David Bowman senior advisor of the Board of Governors uh, these sessions have been well attended and the commentary has been very helpful uh, in getting market participants more aware. Clearly outreach is a key part of this work uh, and uh, as we begin to take this forward we're going to see more and more uh, desire among market participants who may not be as close to this work as the larger, as the larger organizations. Uh, it's certainly clear that the markets need to transition away from LIBOR. Uh, and, and special importance for consumer products as we move forward. This will be a key milestone we take forward. The ARC is fully committed uh, to working with regulators and consumer groups and finding a fair and transparent solution for consumers. 
uh, and certainly we welcome the public-private sector cooperation that is already occurring with the ARC's work. Looking ahead at the remainder of 2019, again, uh, mission, mission critical year, the ARC's key contrib contributions will likely come in the way of improved fallback language for newly issued uh, LIBOR cash contracts and the ongoing discussions with regulators to clear up the remaining uncertainties that could impact the pace of market transitions. Uh, for instance, uh, we would think about some regard, we're working very closely with between the, uh, both the MRACs, uh, uh, between the CFT's MRAC committee, subcommittee on interest rates, and the ARC's uh, regulatory working group to ensure that there's a, that there's consistency between these asks as they come forward. Uh, and then we think about what we might think about in terms of margin and clearing and other developments in the regulatory sector. Uh, and really from there, I'd like to just transition from that point to the work that the, uh, that the MRAC subcommittee is doing. So uh, as, as, as uh, Chair Giancarlo mentioned, the committee was put together in July of 2018 uh, to form a subcommittee on interest rate benchmark reform uh, to provide reports and recommendations to the MRAC on the current uh, LIBOR transition initiatives uh, and the derivatives markets. By December 2018, the CFTC publicly released the membership list of the 21-person committee, which again represents a large cross-section of the market, including asset managers, clearinghouses, end users, exchanges, intermediaries, market makers, service providers, CEFs, and trade associations. The, the MRAC committee uh, met in December, committed to the key following principles. One, to remove regulatory hurdles to the transition to SOFR. Two, to, to, we aim to provide incentives to voluntary conversion via targeted relief for market participants transitioning to SOFR. And three, to avoid the inadvertent creation of a safe harbor in policy changes that would be recommended. Updates since December 2018, we've, the group has come together and we've created three work streams, one on, unclear, one on margin, one on clearing, and one on disclosures. Uh, the subcommittee is reviewing ways on margin where the CFTC's unclear margin rule may cause impediments to the adoption of alternative rates and how potentially these rules could be made, with suggestions these rules could be made. Uh, on clearing, the subcommittee is reviewing ways in which current regulation regarding derivative clearing mandates potentially could cause impediments or reduce incentives to move to, to so for more quickly. And on disclosures, the subcommittee is reviewing existing risk disclosure documents by market participants in order to understand if additional risk disclosures would be appropriate as we move through time. Uh, other comments, I would just like to, again, thank the futures exchanges and the clearinghouses for taking the leadership role in this transition, uh, and their contributions to both ARC and MREC have been critical as we take this forward. That has accelerated the PACE transition plan in a pretty big way. Uh, additionally, I think recently, uh, as my position of board member of ISDA, I think this is an opportunity to, uh, to commend uh, everyone involved in ISDA's plans on consulting on these pre-cessation triggers, which have become a very key issue as we take the work forward. Uh, and again, with the progress that lies ahead, uh, stress the importance of the coordination of all groups around here, the continued outreach, which, uh, which I think among our internal stakeholders, our clients, and, and, and pretty much the rest of the world to make sure that this, this gets out there in a, in a positive way. Uh, and lastly, I think uh, as we think about what to do going forward, we continue to think about ways to use these alternative reference rates now. This is not a 2021 problem. I don't think there's any responsible market participant that wants to take their entire book to the cliff of 2021 and rely on all these fallbacks to work. I think as we move through 2019, we are going to see pricing points that will give people a clear view of what the future looks like. And the goal will be to reduce, le to reduce that legacy book to the smallest number number possible, where possible, to utilize the new rates when and where possible, to reduce risk through new production using the new rates, and as, uh, as, as they say, the best way out of a hole is to stop digging. So uh, those are my comments, and uh, I'll pass it back from there. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Thanks uh, for that uh, comprehensive report. Our time here is drawing to a close, but I think it's important for us to hear from uh, a couple more private sector views. Uh, uh, I wonder if I could ask uh, Beth Hammack from Goldman Sachs to say a few words. Thanks very much. Um, and thank you for inviting me to this session and for convening this group uh, today. I am Goldman Sachs Global Treasurer, and I co-sponsor our, our firm's LIBOR transition efforts. Goldman Sachs is committed to supporting a seamless transition for our clients, the marketplace, and our firm. We've established our own LIBOR transition program to manage the effort, and the program has the full commitment of our senior management and our board. Today, I'd like to touch on three areas that are critical for a smooth transition. Adherence to ISDA protocols in the OTC derivatives market, tempering near-term expectations for a SOFR term rate, 
and official sector relief and or incentives that could help the market transition faster. On ISDA protocols, ensuring a smooth transition from LIBOR for the derivatives market is a critical part of the overall LIBOR transition. About 95% of gross notional exposures to LIBOR in the global markets are derivatives contracts. For OTC derivatives, ISDA is working to amend the 2006 ISDA definitions to implement the alternative rates as fallbacks for the IBOR currencies that can be used for new transactions. These fallback provisions will apply upon the permanent discontinuation of the relevant IBOR based on predetermined objective triggers subject to term and spread adjustments that are being developed through industry consultations. For listed derivatives, clearinghouses are expected to leverage ISDA's work by incorporating the amended definitions into their respective rule books, thereby ensuring that the OTC and derivative markets are aligned. ISDA also expects to launch a protocol to facilitate the inclusion of amended definitions in their legacy OTC derivatives transactions and agreements. Early and widespread adherence to the ISDA protocol will have significant importance in mitigating financial stability risks and will avoid the need for costly bilateral amendments of individual OTC derivatives transactions and agreements. Given the impact that the ISDA protocol process can have to ensure a smooth transition, we, like others, are actively involved in the public consultation review process on triggers, fallbacks, and adjustments to develop an industry consensus that will be sensible for the broader markets. We expect to adhere to the ISDA protocol once released and hope other industry players will follow suit. Broad adoption in the derivatives markets of the protocol terms should encourage cash and other non-derivative markets to adopt similar triggers, fallbacks, and adjustments so that the derivatives and cash markets can align well. On the SOFR term rate, the ARC pace transition plan calls for the creation of a term reference rate based on SOFR in the derivatives market once liquidity has developed sufficiently to produce a robust rate. The ARC anticipates this will be completed by the end of 2021. The Fed, in fact, has already published proposed methodologies for the development of this term rate. While we are supportive that a robust term rate can be developed, we would note that 2021 is too close to the transition's finish line and that the development of this SOFR forward-looking term rate requires broad depth and liquidity in the overnight rate. While the SOFR forward-looking term rate would be helpful for some use cases, largely in the SME borrowing space, we believe many market participants and use cases can easily function with the existing overnight rate. We have seen this through the significant growth in bond issuances, futures trading, and swaps trading that is linked to SOFR in its first year of existence. All of this means that the sooner the markets embrace SOFR, transition protocols, and other mechanisms to amend fallbacks, the more we can expect a smooth transition from LIBOR to SOFR and other alternative rates. We believe the official sector can help incentivize this transition from LIBOR to SOFR by providing tax and regulatory relief, clarity, and or incentives, and including including with respect to Dodd-Frank Title VII rule requirements, capital and leverage treatment of alternative reference rates. These initiatives could help speed up SOFR adoption to more rapidly liquefy the market. We're pleased to hear that both the CFTC and the Treasury are interested in engaging with the market on specific uh, requests and rule sets and, and more clarity around what that, that specific relief is needed. In addition, the official sector can continue to help identify and implement industry-wide mechanisms to operationalize the transition by, for example, working with data providers and technology firms, as well as accounting and legal firms, to ensure there's broad understanding and consensus of what the industry needs to do to make this transition happen. In conclusion, thank you for inviting me and for hosting this important discussion. Market participant education and awareness is a key ingredient to this transition, and more of this needs to be done, but forums such as this are a good step in advancing the dialogue. Goldman Sachs is committed to supporting a truth, smooth transition for our clients, the marketplace, and our firm, and we look forward to continued dialogue on this topic. Thank you. Thanks, Beth. Thank you very much. Uh, the view of one treasurer, a pretty important one, but perhaps we could turn to Tom Diaz for, from the National Association of Corporate Treasurers for some thoughts. Thank you very much. Um, I've, uh, I'm the chairman of the National Association of Corporate Treasurers, and I've been a CFO and, and treasurer of U.S. Uh, manufacturing companies, large publicly listed companies, for over 35 years. I began my effort at reforming benchmark interest rates in this very building when uh, former chairman Gary Gensler asked me for input as he analyzed uh, interest, uh, his, his analysis of uh, US dollar LIBOR trading. Uh, and also at his request in 2013, I joined this group's market participants group that took the first look at uh, reforming interest rates. And we reported out to you in 2014 and included a survey of corporate treasurers that tried to identify 
the various uses of, of LIBOR and, and associated IBORs throughout uh, corporate America. Um, these uses are very widespread. I think everyone would recognize that corporate borrowers uh, are uh, participants in committed domestic credit agreements, multi-currency credit agreements, term loans, floating rate notes, and asset securitizations along with the associated interest rate swaps. But there are also uh, many other ways that corporate treasurers uh, use instruments to manage their day-to-day -day liquidity that include uh, LIBOR. Uh, for instance, we have agreements with uh, our affiliates, with customers, suppliers, and even employees that use these rates, uh, such as inter-affiliate uh, and intra-group loans, asset purchase and sale agreements, long-term supply agreements, strategic capital goods purchases, and employee benefit payment obligations, all of which have adjustment clauses for timing based on, uh, on LIBOR. I confess to you that many of my colleagues are only now starting to identify their corporate-wide exposures and develop a plan to amend the long list of agreements that they have to enter into through negotiation with their contract counterparties. Let's consider uh, or recall the uh, startup of the euro as a cash currency and the withdrawal of national currencies. We had a very long parallel period. We had a calculation mechanism that was agreed in advance, and the equivalent number of euros were substituted in transitioning contracts well ahead of the cutover date. However, today, since there's no agreed mechanism to convert from a term LIBOR rate plus a credit spread to an overnight SOFR rate plus a different credit spread, parties have to negotiate a mutually acceptable substitution, all while not knowing the required transition date. The ARC's fallback language we've developed should help, but there are still many market uncertainties. At the ARC, we've modeled over historical periods what term SOFA rates would have been and compared them to the equivalent term uh, US dollar LIBOR rates. In examining a two and a half month period last year, we found the change in LIBOR SOFA basis of, of 25 basis points. A corporate treasurer who agreed at the beginning of that period to amend his credit agreement from LIBOR plus 100 basis points to SOFR plus 140 basis points, as the data indicated at the beginning of that period, would have regretted to learn that by the uh, two and a half months later, the end of the period, the basis has contracted 25 basis points, and the end of period pricing should have been SOFR plus 115 basis points. Uh, the solution to all of this is in developing the cash and derivatives market so that through actual transaction arbitrage, these differences narrow, especially for forward-looking term rates. The FSB, OSSG, and each of our country's uh, official sectors, as I've commented earlier, can work to reduce uncertainty in timing, regulations, tax, and accounting treatments to speed this required transition and thereby build the liquidity that we require to make the conversion. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. And let's end, if we can, with some comments from uh, Pat McCoy uh, from the Government Finance Officers Association. Thank you very much. I'm uh, happy to be here representing uh, GFOA, which uh, represents 20,000 members across the United States, state and local governmental entities that uh, rely on the, the tax-exempt bond to provide uh, the infrastructure uh, in this country. We pro uh, estimate that uh, the tax-exempt bond has provided about 75% of our core infrastructure across the United States. So GFOA um, takes this very seriously, and we're very interested in helping our, our members and the issuer community in general uh, to address the cessation of LIBOR. Um, our participation on the ARC is especially important to uh, the public markets where we promote transparency to ensure that investors have appropriate material information about municipal securities. Uh, our communication with uh, government and nonprofit issuers across the country has emphasized that the work of the ARC is to ensure that issuers and end users have comprehensive guidance. And, uh, and I just want to compliment the ARC for its work that has, it has consistently provided uh, this guidance to, um, to the end users. Um, I, uh, my daytime job is the director of finance at the MTA in New York, where we have a diverse portfolio of about $40 billion in uh, bonds outstanding, uh, supporting the transportation network in the city. Um, 
it's pr predominantly comprised of fixed rate obligations. However, we do have a natural variable rate and synthetic variable rate in the portfolio. Uh, some of those uh, securities are key to LIBOR, so we're very interested in this. To that end, uh, in the fourth quarter last year, we became the first issuer of a SOFR linked FRN uh, through our Triborough Bridge and Tunnel Authority credit, and we're very pleased with how that uh, how that obligation has performed in the markets since that issuance. Um, variable rate debt tied to indices such as SIFMA or LIBOR has consistently and continues to be a reliable issuance choice for a low-cost method of financing as compared to issuing fixed-rate bonds. Obviously, that comes with certain risks, and so uh, GFOA does encourage its members to adhere to its best practices and take on only so much of that risk as it can manage. Um, while comparably smaller than the uh, for-profit sector, uh, LIBOR, uh, LIBOR exposure in the tax-exempt space uh, penetrates at a variety of levels. Uh, floating rate notes are issued, uh, issued by uh, large issuers such as the MTA and are comparably longer in duration than our private sector counterparts, uh, although not always. Um, additionally, commercial banks provide uh, smaller entities with the option to borrow through privately placed debt often based on LIBOR. So again, we want to make sure that our uh, uh, issuer community has access to the information that's needed uh, to, uh, to migrate through this transition. GFOA has a long history of creating and maintaining these industry best practices, and uh, we do have uh, pr best practices on the use of variable rate debt as well as uh, uh, derivative products. Uh, we support efforts to ensure that robust fallback provisions are in place and are accessible to all issuers participating in the cash markets. Uh, we know that the market will prefer as much clarity at the time of issuance as, um, uh, as possible for any new uh, LIBOR-based FRN or a derivative. Uh, clarity and process for both the issuer and the investor is very important, and we support all those efforts uh, to that end. Um, obviously, legacy contracts must be addressed as well. Although the ARC has not yet addressed this in, in completeness, um, it is intended to be an important part of the ARC's agenda, and we support those ongoing efforts. Um, to the degree that the uh, ARC uh, may seek uh, legislative solutions in New York State, where a majority of market participants have agreed to New York law in their contracts, uh, we will also obviously participate there as well. Um, we believe that the uh, issuer language that uh, highlights a clearly defined and orderly process with limited unknowns is, is, is uh, essential, and doing so would help both the issuer and the investor efficiently price new LIBOR-based contracts and effectively manage the transition that we're all very concerned about. So thank you for your uh, uh, time and for the opportunity to address this uh, uh, distinguished group. Thank, yep. you. thank you. Thanks, Pat. And uh, we're over our uh, hour, uh, but I want to thank you all uh, for your uh, time today. I think this has been uh, certainly a very useful meeting. I think for us in the official sector, a useful meeting in reinforcing the, both the importance of this process and the critical point we are in it. Uh, and uh, uh, committing to taking the steps necessary to cross the finish line. Uh, I want to thank you all for your commitment to the process. And uh, various people have been peeling away, like the Von Trapp family. Uh, uh, <laughs> so it's time for us all to say farewell. And uh, thank you. The meeting is adjourned. <laughs>